Right, so um, take care of the legal stuff uh, first and foremost. Uh, as I said, formerly the director of consumer insights for footlocker.com. Uh, now an independent market marketing uh, analytics consultant working with the loyal customer loyalty management agency. Um, so the the slides, comments, views um, are expressly my own and do not in any way reflect the views of Foot Locker Inc. or any of its subsidiaries. Hopefully that covers all the legal stuff there. Uh, so I'm here to talk about um, uh, multi-channel data collection. I think it's very um, closely aligned with, with some of the things that. that that Tom was just was speaking about, and from my perspective, on the uh, as a practitioner in using all of the data, um, I was I was really thinking about what's the journey of where do we begin in bringing all of these different data points together? Um, what should we add to the data sets to start getting meaningful um, insights? Um, and then how do we bring them all together? Um, what are the internal resources that we have available to us? Um, and should I use a third party to, you know, to do this? So looking at kind of starting off with you, what are the purchase behaviors um, on, on the retail side? From there, what, how do we start to identify customers? And ultimately, how do we start to create meaningful marketing communications that um, ultimately lead to a deeper understanding of the customer um, and give us the opportunity to build that one-on-one -on -one relationship with the customer and make all of our touch points with them um, much more meaningful. Um, so along the way, I'll, I'll talk about how you know, we use the data um, as we start to bring it all together. Um, and f again, fundamentally, it's about creating that one-on-one -on -one relationship. Um, so where to begin? Uh, Merging your offline sales and online sales um, is, you know, basically, and we'll see this in a little bit, is it's not a trivial exercise. There's an awful lot that goes into it. Um, and there's, there, it's fraught with, with um, challenges um, along the way. Primarily on the, on the retail side, the cash transaction, you know, that is, you know, um, a totally anonymous um, experience if a, if a customer only pays with cash, um, you know, barring the, you know, the use of uh, a loyalty card. Um, credit cards and debit cards, they give you a, uh, a limited amount of information that you can use. Um, and then ultimately, you know, loyalty uh, cards um, are great, but only if the customer uses them. And it's really, really important for those of you, you know, working in that customer loyalty um, uh, area to remember that you know, the customer loyalty, if it's a data collection vehicle only, it's, it's ultimately going to, you know, you know, start flounder or, you know, crash on, on the rocks. You know, it needs to have some perceived benefit to the customer. They have to see that there's something in it for them, because if it's only about collecting information from you, you're, you're never going to get nearly as far as, as you want to. Um, for those out there who are also doing, you know, cash-based um, you know, receipt surveys, they're great. Um, my experience with them, though, has been you, you're typically getting response rates in the single digits to low double digits. So you're getting a lot of really great information about customers who are willing to take the time and give that to you. Um, but it's again, it's a very, very small subset of your customers. Um, and then, you know, sort of the, the holy grail for, for me on, on the, the retail side is the customer who walks out of your store and, and doesn't buy something from you, why did they leave? And how do you get the information from them uh, about what their experience was? Was it customer service? Was it product selection? Was it price? If they're walking out, um, you know, you, on the retail side, you know, my experience with Foot Locker is, is a customer could come into a store um, and make a purchase. It may not have been the shoe they wanted or the color run that they wanted, but you know, if, they, if they make a purchase and they walk out of the store with something, they ultimately have some level of satisfaction. But the person who walks out without making a purchase, who doesn't walk out with the, you know, the bag in hand, you, knowing what led them to walk out of the store is is a treasure trove of information, um, and I think there's there's technologies that are getting closer to to giving you that opportunity to survey that customer. But right now, it's it, you know, in my perspective, still very much um, uh, the holy grail. Um, Millennials, um, in terms of sort of the loyalty piece and collecting customer information, um, you know, millennials, as as we all know. Um, 
are absolutely willing to share a tremendous amount about themselves, about their behaviors, about their likes and dislikes and what they're willing to do, but only if they see that there's something in it for them. So, you know, as you're creating, you know, the loyalty programs and working, you know, using that as a vehicle to understand what, um, what it is that motivates your customer and, and what drives them to engage with you, um, if they don't see that they're getting something either um, new product, a release information, discounts, um, you know, insights into you know, what's great about this product, you know, they're not going to share their information. They, they have to perceive that there's something in it um, for them. Um, and then another caveat on the, the, u the use of credit card and debit cards. Um, in using that as to identify your customer, you have to be very, very careful that you're not confusing the person who's paying for the product versus the person who's actually using the product. Um, on the Foot Locker side, and I'm sure this is very true for other um, retailers um, in that space, uh, you know, they're, you know, you're buying $150, $200, $250 pair of sneakers, um, and it could be the parent that's making the purchase, but you know, a 16, 17, 18 year old is actually wearing them. And so if you're capturing the credit card or debit card information, you could be capturing about you know, the 45 year old uh, suburban mom and you know, the likelihood that she's, you know, she's buying a pair of Jordan retros. Not that it doesn't happen, just to be very careful that you're not confusing who's paying for it with who's actually using um, your product. Um, um, so online gives you the opportunity to, uh, to capture a tremendous amount of information um, about your customer. So in addition to the, the sites that brought them to you, what they do on your site, how much time they're spending on your site, you're also capturing their name, their mailing address, um, billing and shipping addresses, uh, phone numbers, cell phone numbers, um, and email addresses. So you know, the, the ability to engage with your consumer online is you know, the part that really gives you the really deep um, information about who they are. Um, on the retail side, one of uh, the other areas that I would uh, caution you is, is making sure that if the, the retail product taxonomy um, matches your online product taxonomy because you know, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a large effort for sort of a, a master data management effort to make sure that um, those two things align. You, know, you need to make sure that you know, product keys are the same, um, product descriptions are the same. So here I just kind of put a very you know, basic example where you've got a retail product key of one, two, three, four, and a description of a large T-shirt, and an online product key of six, seven, eight, nine, and it's LGT hyphen shirt. So it very well may be the exact same product, but the ability to link that together can be very, very challenging, especially when you're dealing with you know, thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of SKUs. So, um, so you sort of have to figure out, you know, are the, the, the taxonomies the same? Um, if they're not, how are you going to link them together? Is there going to be a translation table? Or are you going to convert one to the other? Um, and if so, who's going to maintain that over time? Uh, again, you know, just not a, a, a trivial exercise. Um, on the areas of, of what to add, um, obviously email communication, and you know it's not just about the, you know sending them the email, but how many emails did you send? Um, how many emails are opened? Um, uh, how many emails are clicked through? What types of email messages are they opening? Which ones are they clicking through? Does it tend to be particular products, you know, new product releases? Does it tend to be those that? Um, are highlighting either things like free shipping or deep discounts in their offers, because that's going to give you a lot more insight about your customer as well. So the ability to classify what types of emails um, really spur them to, to respond. Um, online display advertising, uh, another element that's, that's very important in there. Um, the SEO and SEM data, and you know, you know, Tom was just talking about you know, what keywords and what's actually coming through on there. Can you understand what did they type in to bring them to your site, and does that help to, te you know, to tell you a lot about what you should be you know, sort of focusing on with your SEO and, and SEM? Um, direct mail pieces, do you still do, you know, um, one of Foot, Locker, Foot Locker's brands still published uh, a catalog 15 to 18 times a year going out to about 2 million customers each and every time. Uh, so how do you bring that piece in? How do you know if you're sending the, the catalog to people 
who um, were likely to already buy versus those that um, were, you know, that when you sent them to them, that's what spurred them to, you know, to make a purchase. So understanding the difference between, you know, response rates and, you know, incremental or uplift um, uh, values of the customer. Um, affiliate advertising, things like Retail Me Not, um, um, eBay, so those kinds of sites, you know, those tell you about customers who may be very much motivated by the best kind of discount that they can get and, you know, the likelihood of them to make a repeat purchase going forward. Um, and then, um, obviously, the ability to start bringing in social media. How many people, you know, have liked your posts? How many people are retweeting, um, you know, things that you're, you're putting out there? And how do you start to capture all of that and then link those pieces um, all together? Um, so um, on the um, integration of bringing it all together, the, the loyalty card is absolutely um, your best friend. Um, it allows you to link a name, an email address across multiple touch points and multiple purchases. Um, but again, it, it has to be something that the customer sees that there's real value in. Um, if it's just you know, something that they could get, you know, whether they walk into the store or go online anyway, it's not going to be something that's, that's terribly um, uh, appealing to them. Um, the other thing that we experienced with, um, with, with some of our, our sites was even customers who um, had loyalty programs, only about 20 to 30 percent um, would actually log into the site, even if they you know, they had actually previously registered on that site. So everything up until they make a purchase, you, know, you don't know that you already know that customer. So the ability to capture information um, from them you know, through things like um, device IDs um, and um, cookies, uh, things like that, it's very, very important to, to, you know, to bear all those in mind as you're trying to bring all of these um, pieces of information together. Um, as you start to bring these things um, all into a, a, a single repository so you're getting this holistic view of your customer, some other things to bear in mind are things like names and addresses. Uh, the national change um, of, um, of address is a great tool that helps you understand that Paul McNamara used to live in Philadelphia. Now he lives in north central Wisconsin. So you're starting to track that person and you, you, you're able to identify that this is actually uh, the, the same individual. Uh, you have to make decisions about whether you're going to household the data or whether you're going to create individual IDs because you could have three to four people in one household making purchases with your brand. If you start sending um, email pieces and um, direct mail pieces that are geared towards a, you know, sort of a um, you know, suburban um, mom or dad, and you know the the person that you actually want want to be speaking to um, is the 18 year old son or, or, or daughter in that household. You know you may be losing the right you know, opportunity to speak with that customer if you're just rolling up to the household level. So being cognizant of the fact that there is um, definitely opportunities and reasons to um, speak with that household because you may be wanting to to reach out to everyone in there but you also may need to be very, very specific about how you're gonna reach you know, the 17-year-old the female that's in that household and not speak to her like she's you know, a 50-some-year-old um, you know, man who, who, who um, plays basketball on the weekends sometimes. Um, other things, um, you know, billing versus shipping addresses. Um, so oftentimes people will uh, you know, have things shipped to them in different addresses. So how are you handling all of those things? Do you have a, a process in place to capture all of that information? Um, and then other things like watching for spelling um, mistakes. You would not believe the number of people who actually can you know, spell their name incorrectly or um, spell the name of their street or their town incorrectly, don't know their zip codes. Um, other things, you know, even as simple as you know, on, on some uh, transactions, you may register as P. McNamara, and other times it might be Paul McNamara, and sometimes I might put, inadvertently put a space between this, the C and the N in McNamara, and so it's all of these little things that can start to throw off your data collection, and, and you start identifying people as individual customers when in actuality they're all the same person. 
Um, there's things that help to kind of um, alleviate some of that. You can use um, some fuzzy logic, and, and, and there's some Python scripts that help to kind of strip out spaces and, um, and vowels and things like that, so you can start to kind of just break it down into, it's like P McNamara, and it's just P M C N M R, and you start to say, okay, this really looks like it's the same person, despite the fact that sometimes he used Paul McNamara, sometimes it was Paul J, sometimes it was Paul Mac with a space and all those you know, variations of, of what actually can, can happen. Um, email addresses um, is another area that can be fraught with, with difficulty, uh, simply because we all have multiple emails. Sometimes I register um, and make a purchase with my personal email. Sometimes I'll do it with a um, with, with a work email address, and then other times I may register on a site with a junk email because it's some place that all of those offers will go to, and I can kind of wade through that when I have the inclination or just do a mass delete because it's just filled up with a lot of um, nonsense that, that I really you know, had no interest in, in taking a look at. So you need to be careful about you know, how you link all of those pieces together with you know, this, this individual. So Paul McNamara could have two different addresses in your system, three different email addresses, um, but they're all, ref they're all pointing back to the same individual and you really want to try and create the, the opportunity to link those pieces of information together so that you really understand Paul McNamara as, uh, in his um, entirety instead of all these individual experiences. Um, digital data. Uh, the other area that, that we were running into some really interesting um, uh, uh, challenges with was multiple devices because we had people who would be using their mobile device to do research about product, but then going home and showing it to um, the person who's actually gonna buy it, and then they, they, they consummate that transaction um, on the desktop. So how do you know that the person who was actually spending all of that time you know, researching a product um, on their mobile device is the same person who made the, the, the actual purchase once they, you know, they got home and, and, uh, um, and, and used their desktop? Things, you know, a lot of areas where we're sort of moving into, is, you know, cookies are a great thing, but people delete their cookies from time to time. What happens when they get a new device? You know, so somebody, you know, you had an iPhone, now they switch over and they've got, you know, a Samsung, you know, and, and how do you link that back to, you know, understanding that that's actually the, the same individual? Um, some of the, 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 the less sexy things that you get into with, with data collection is understanding your privacy policy um, and the use of cookies. What does your private, you know, it's really important that you understand what your privacy policy states um, that you can do and that it's communicated um, to the, the consumer and it gives them the opportunity to understand what are you gonna do with their data. Um, and then um, also making sure that you get your, your legal team, um, either your um, in-house legal team or some, sort, some form of outside counsel to give you a point of view on what you can do with that, uh, with that information. Um, because you, you, one of the things it says in there is that you, that, you know, that you can use it and you will share it with you know, um, uh, authorized third parties. Well, does that mean that the, the company that's doing your, your online ad displays, does that become an arm of your marketing department and so you're, you're technically allowed to know what sites they were delivering all of that information on and pass that information back to you? Or do you take a more conservative view and say, we don't want to know what sites Paul McNamara is on when we delivered this ad. We just want to know that he was, on, you know, that he was delivered this ad you know, on this day and at, the, at this time. Um, there's a great resource out there. Um, it's the, uh, I'll read it, it's the Fair Information Practices in the Electronic Marketplace, a Federal Trade Commission Report to Congress. It's thrilling reading. Thrilling, absolutely. But um, it, it's the, the great thing to take away from that is that you know it's mostly a set of guidelines and best practices of what people are doing and what they're. Can, there's no sort of rules and regulations of you can and cannot you know do this. Um, there were certainly um, uh, many efforts on the part of the the, the FTC to try and put in. Um, rules and regulations, but um, in the U.S. we have a very pro-business um, 
uh, Congress, and so they absolutely shut down anything that would limit businesses' opportunity to communicate um, with their customer and understand that customer. So it kind of takes a very, very um, uh, laissez-faire attitude towards, uh, you know, in the U.S., you know, specifically uh, customer information. Once you get outside the U.S., all bets are off. Um, it's really, really complex because you're having to deal with every country's um, you know, rules and regulations about what you can and cannot know and the right to be forgotten and, and all of this. So we you know, at, at Phil Locker had um, really just focused on the U.S. Um, with the view to expanding that beyond. Um, once, we, you know, once we understood enough about the U.S., um, environment, then we you felt we'd start to try and tackle some of the, the areas outside the U.S., particularly um, Europe. Um, uh, COPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, um, it's really important um, to make sure that you're, um, you're, you're very aligned um, with this. You know, it's about you know, what you can and cannot know about children under the age of 13. We certainly, um, in my, uh, in our, our, my experiences across Foot Locker, um, Aramar, and, and McDonald's, other places that, that, that I've spent time, really focused on those consumers 13 and above, um, just because you don't really want to get into you know, you know, really dealing with um, you know, the, the 12 and under and, and so forth. Um, Future um, uh, technologies that I think are going to make a lot of the um, customer identification a lot easier is tokenization. Um, the ability when a customer um, you know, s swipes their credit card, the, the ability to create a unique token for that, and so you don't have to um, you know, pass along you know, credit card information, but you're rather getting you know, a unique identifier that's linked to a customer. Um, certainly, um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the areas that I think will kind of alleviate um, a lot of the concerns about, you know, practitioners having too much PII about, you know, do you, you know, do you have exposure to somebody's credit card information? How do you make sure that you, you're being compliant with, uh, with all of those rules and regulations? Um, um, and then finally, you know, should I use a third party? Um, as you get into this, there's, there's a number of them out there, um, such as um, uh, Epsilon and uh, um, Axiom, third parties that do a lot of this data integration and, 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 you know, and many more. Um, they have the expertise in bringing all of these disparate data sources together and the ability um, to link them up, um, but they are expensive. You know, that's, that's just the, you know, so the, the you know, the, the nuts and bolts of it. It's gonna cost you a lot to, you know, to do this, but it may be worth it if you don't have the, the internal resources um, to do it your own. Um, some things that I would um, you know, recommend with that is um, they don't know your data as well as you do. Uh, so you need to be involved and have your IT teams involved um, at every step of the way with, with a, a large sort of data integration process. Um, Make sure that it's iterative. Don't just give them all of your data and expect them to link all together and hand it back to you and have everything you know, uh, work just seamlessly. Um, it, it's, it's less likely to actually happen. Do an iterative process. Give them pieces of information. Make sure that they're linking it together. And then once they've established that you know, they've been able to link you know, the first two data sources together, provide another, and then sort of you, you do that iterative process over and over until you finally have all of your different data points um, linked together. Um, and then you, when using a, a, a third party or you know, e even internally if you're building this, um, is make sure that the platform um, that, that they're building on or that you're building on will serve you for the future. Um, I'm not sure that anybody's not interested in unstructured data anymore, but there's some people who are like, you know, that we've got enough data to, ha you know, to work with today. I don't really need to deal with the, the social comments and the, the, the agent chats and, and, and things like that. But five years from now, you may be very interested in all of those things, and you want to make sure that the platform that you have um, is, um, is, is, is capable of handling that information um, should you need it. Um, so, um, some summary um, elements. Um, merging your offline and online sales data, it, it's not a trivial exercise, but it will provide you with uh, a tremendous insights um, about your customer. Um, 
things, you know, the ability, once you have this data together, you're able to do a lot of things like um, do some, you know, the ability to segment your customers um, based on things like recency, frequency, and, and, and monetization. Um, you know, understanding what they buy from you, how often they buy from you, um, and how much they're spending. And then you can you know, do surveys with them based on you know, their behaviors on you know, things like the customer who only buys from you once um, in any particular period versus the person uh, who might be really deeply engaged with you, who's buying across multiple product categories and multiple times per year. The ability to understand the differences between those customers um, will allow you to create marketing communication uh, tools that is going to be very specific to them and, and give you the greatest opportunity um, to get them to, to engage with you either more deeply or more frequently. You certainly don't want to speak to one of your very best customers like they're just a one-time buyer. Um, so you want to be able to use all of this information to truly understand the customer and create the vehicles that's going to uh, help them understand that you know them better than, than your competition knows them and that that gives them a reason to um, engage with you um, on, a more, uh, 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 on, on a much deeper level. Um, also the ability to do demographic segmentation um, not necessarily you know, one of the things that we were doing, but um, certainly still very valuable. You know, our biggest caveat with that was if, if we're using just demographic information based on credit card and debit card, you know, we're, we're classifying our, um, you know, um, you know, our, our key customers, and we might be calling them you know, um, mall moms when actually they're an 18-year-old boy. And if you start sending you know, um, you know, marketing tools that are geared towards a mall mom, you, you, you know, it's going right in the garbage. So. Um, that's something to be uh, uh, cognizant of as well. Um, and then you know, th others like behavioral, what, uh, what, uh, um, what are they buying from you? you know, how often, you know, what are the, you, when you get feedback from them, what are they telling you um, about, your, um, about your engagement? Um, and so one of the things you know, in closing that uh, I'd say is, you know, is bear in mind that um, the customer views your online and offline, um, they view you as an integrated entity. They, they're expecting a seamless experience. They don't view your online presence any differently um, than what the, the retail experience is. So you know, they want to make sure, you want to make sure that that creates this seamless experience um, in the customer's mind. Um, and, and use that, use all of the data to help you formulate that. How should your websites look in relation to your in-store experiences? Um, and um, ultimately, it's about you know, creating that, that um, holistic view of the customer so that you're communic communica communicating with them um, on a one-to-one -one basis. And it makes them feel like that you know them better than anybody else um, in that space. And it gives them a reason to, to engage with you um, deeper and more frequently. With that, okay. I will. Thank you, Paul. Yep, thank you. Let's go and open up for a few questions. Tom, a lot of similar veins is what you were talking about. Um, a couple things, just curious. Sure. Uh, when you talked about customer loyalty and all the insights that you guys were finding in different loyalty programs or methods or even things as simple as what you might do in a store to attract a customer, were there things that always rise to the top as far as um, tactics for customer loyalty? It, you know what, the funny thing is, is it, there's nothing that, that there's, there's no sort of um, one size fits all when it comes to customer loyalty. Um, on, it, with Foot Locker, one of the things that we found with customer loyalty was just the ability to uh, launch products was a very big um, element for um, for Foot Locker and for you know others in that athletic um, apparel space, so the ability to maybe get advance notice of when the shoe was coming out and maybe getting a you know a higher you know um, the uh, uh, the opportunity to get uh, a reservation for that you know, it, it really depends on what the the product is the the discount wasn't nearly you know so you think well loyalty it's about you know, if, I, if I'm spending a lot with you, I should get deeper discounts with, with that, uh, that particular customer. They weren't really interested in the discount. They just wanted to make sure they got the shoe because there was only a limited number of them. So, you know, there was no way that everybody who wanted a, a new, you know, Nike, um, 
you know, um, basketball shoe w was going to get it, so it was very limited. And you know, the ability to have them rise above everybody else would, would be you know far more important than giving them a 10% discount on it. That's good. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, with Foot Locker, um, it, it, it tended to be the, there was a definite um, distinction because you would find in store it tended to be uh, uh, skewed very much a younger demographic, whereas online you, you found that people across all um, age and gender groups would make purchases because you know, they might have been, been searching for a Nike free and Foot Locker comes up as one of the, the search things and they'll just click on that and go there. Um, so online you tend to get a much, you know, Wider things, but very, very seldom did you find the the you know, sort of the 45 to 54 year old you know you know suburban male who was going into the 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 Foot Locker Mall to you know to make a purchase for a pair of you know running shoes that sort of thing. So it tended to be skewing much younger, sort of the 22 um, and younger um, you know in, actually in store. Any other questions? Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you.